real spicy topics. I am on a two-week streak of having no hot takes on The WAN Show, and I'm afraid that it is about to end because I am angry. Yeah. I dropped in on Anthony's short circuit unboxings of both the Mac Studio and the new studio display. And I think it would be fair to say that I was quite upset by both of them. <laughs> Rage inducing? But for one of them, I was upset in a positive way. Oh, whoa. That's oh. right. We're also going to be talking about the million dollar unboxing. What else we got? That sounds cool. I have no idea what that is. Xbox Cloud Gaming Beta on Steam Deck. I should have seen this coming, but didn't. I don't know why, but I, sick, I didn't hey? see it coming. Also, uh, Dr. Disrespect is developing an FPS game that will give fans the chance to win an opportunity to buy an NFT. That's not a news topic. That's just... <laughs> Squarespace, NordPass, and JumpCloud are our sponsors today. Let's jump right into the first topic. Obviously, we talked previously on the WAN show in, well, I'm reasonable, enough depth. You guys, you guys, you watch the Apple event, you know what's going on. Um, two of the big products that Apple announced are the Mac Studio lineup featuring their new up to M1 Ultra chip, which is actually pretty cool the technology behind it the way that they're taking two separate gpus on two separate dies and fabricating them together is something that has been conceptualized in the past but has not actually been done apple did it i mean they leapfrogged the supposed gpu specialists when they do the whole freaking soc like it's it's a feat but what was really frustrating about the Mac Studio was that Apple was just like, oh, you want to upgrade it after the fact? Well, you know what? We were super cool about that with the Mac Pro, but for the Mac Studio, you can just go and take a giant fart, I guess, because there's no upgradability. Yeah, except, right. except maybe there is. Anthony opened it up which is relatively straightforward. You just pry off the little rubber ring on the bottom and there's some screws. Those screws yeah. could have easily been somewhere else so you don't have to destroy the adhesive on the rubber ring. Thanks, Apple. But no, uh, heaven forbid we have any screws. Or, or engineer a little locking mechanism for the ring. That would have been... Uh, <laughs> Might come undone. Technology like that simply doesn't exist. No, of course not. I walked in. Anthony was opening up the Mac Studio... And I was like, hey, what, what, what's that thing? And he picks it up. He's like, it's, what is this? it's the SSD. Not only can the SSD be removed and replaced, but there's actually an extra slot. An additional. There's yeah. an additional one. Not just like wired in, but actually the hardware there, right? Well, uh, no, no, like there's a new, sl yeah, there's a slot. I mean, why would they put a slot yeah. there if it's not connected to anything? Yeah. Now, crazy. here, we have no way to confirm this yet, but here is my worst case scenario. My best case scenario, okay, is that Apple will have these slots in there and users could conceivably upgrade their storage in the future without resorting to external Thunderbolt storage. That's my best case scenario. We'll have companies like OWC releasing third-party SSDs that you can upgrade your Mac with or whatever the case may be. That's my best case scenario. You want to hear my worst case scenario? I think I can assume. One of the things I noticed about the SSD module is that it doesn't appear to have any DRAM or any controller on it. Now, there are DRAMless SSDs Ooh. these days that you can achieve reasonable performance with, and Apple does have DRAM right on package on the M1 series. So conceivably, it could be using a small carved out amount 
of yeah. its own DRAM to fulfill the same function. Kind of actually, I kind of doubt that one, to be perfectly honest with you. But it, but it is conceivable that they could be doing that. And we also know that the M1 SOC, the, the M1 series SOCs, contain SSD controllers. So it is my worst case doomsday scenario uh, guess that Apple may actually be locking the capacity through firmware with the excuse being encryption and security. Right. Which is a commonplace excuse. In spite of the fact that clearly it has not one, but two SSD slots, back to why it might have two, why would you have two if it's not upgradable? Surely Apple would only ever put in one unless these are just dumb. They're just dumb NAND packages that the SSD controller interfaces with. And if there was any kind of change and a proper handshake didn't occur between the controller and the packages, it would just not work. Right. That is my worst case scenario. What do you think it is? Oh. You had to pick one. And not like pick one that you want it to be, but what, what one do you like suspect is going on? I think that unless there is enough consumer backlash, like we saw with, what was the thing they backtracked on? Uh, oh, uh, locking, locking the screens, locking the screens to, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, locking the screen serial numbers. I think unless there's enough backlash and frankly, I doubt the Mac audience particularly for this product. What's it start at like four grand or something like that? Or $2,800 yeah. for the non-ultra one? I suspect that the audience for this product simply isn't loud enough and numerous enough to register on Apple's upset o meter compared to the iPhone audience, right? When the iPhone audience is mad about something as mainstream as not being able to get a freaking screen replacement at the mall, that amount of noise is going to be up here. Mac Studio users, okay? Then we've got, okay, Mac users, studio level Mac users, ones that might actually care about upgrading their own stuff. I mean, we're, we're, we're below the level of the table by that point in comparison to the- It's a pretty small the, percentage of people. And it's, a, and it's a small percentage of people that if they're buying this product, their price is probably not their like absolute number one concern, you know? So they'll probably just pay to upgrade to something else. Well, it's a very it's a very business focused product. So I'm, I, I don't. The truth is, I don't know. I just okay. don't know. Are you guys testing it? Are you guys going to try to figure it out? Uh, I don't think we have two Mac Studios coming, but that would be a cool way to test it. Just plug a second one in and see yeah. what happens. I'll have to I'll have to check. Maybe we do have two coming. If so, that's absolutely a video that we'd love to do next week. I'm I'm frustrated, and the thing that frustrates me the most is that you can tell that Apple understands the value of modular components that are easily replaceable when it benefits them. Supply chain stuff, et cetera, Right, et yeah, well, yeah. that's exactly it. Apple does lock their boards, right? Their main boards to an amount of RAM now because they went and they put the DRAM on package, right? So that's not on die. That means you've got your SOC die and then on the same like like substrate on the same little green PCB part on that same package they've got their their DRAM chips right and there are benefits to having the DRAM as close as possible to the processor we see this on GPUs for example uh, rather than try rather if you've got uh, too many chips right uh, rather than put some of them uh, you know oh, out here farther you'll see them put them like in between the PCIe slot and the GPU uh, the GPU die itself they want all of them as close as possible there are absolutely benefits in terms of performance for that but supply chain wise the the more variations you want to have of your product oh we've got this these different processors and these different RAM amounts and these different storage amounts all of a sudden this becomes an exponentially multiplying number of different SKUs you have to maintain if it's all fully integrated. So Apple does have to do that with the different CPU SKUs, right. whether you want Max or Ultra or whatever else, yeah. as well as RAM amounts. And then SSDs, oh man, if you had to have one of these and one of these and one of these, one of these and one of these and one of these, one of these and one of these, oh, it becomes a nightmare, right? So the SSDs are understandably modular. But then Apple stops understanding why that's important when it isn't about their supply chain management 
when it's about keeping parts out of landfills or it's about uh, convenience when you're deploying a, a fleet of machines and you want to quickly be able to have yeah. your technicians perform maintenance on something and get it back out into the field. They they just develop this kind of uh, this kind of amnesia about why that would be important. And it's incredibly frustrating to me because the issue is that Apple engineers things to be worse. They go, they put actual real work and money into making something worse. And it just makes me angry. It's, it should probably. I yeah. Anyone I'm entirely on board. With anyone that. who ex expends time and energy and money to make the world crappier is just not worthy of my respect. There's a lot of that, unfortunately. And that's just the way it's gonna be. Yeah. We're not gonna we're not gonna we're not I, I, I don't accept it. I'm frustrating. So moving on. I don't have any counterpoints. It, I, I hate that kind of stuff, so I disagree with you. I haven't watched Marquez's video, but a lot of people in float plane chat are talking about it. Something about giving them a shout out for environmentally friendly packaging, but then saying, oh, but you can't upgrade it at all. Yeah, I mean, it's a very mixed message, isn't it? The impact of a little bit of plastic compared to the impact of e-waste is not even close. I think the environmental friendly packaging is very easy very uh what do you say that high visibility win yeah and the non-upgradability is is a lot under there yeah. yeah not a lot of people are necessarily going to notice it but the impact is actually higher yeah um which just really sucks so yeah some people in the in the chat are saying this take isn't very hot um, well, I'm I'm feeling hot. I'm, so the, I, I th yeah, I think the anger and the frustration is high, but I think a lot of people agree with you. Is, I is am on. now, and then and then. So the the best part of this is that I was on my way to the million dollar unboxing. Yeah. And okay. I walked through the Mac Studio bit, and I was like, "What?" <laughs> and then I was walking back from the million dollar unboxing to the WAN show, and Anthony had moved on to the new studio display. And Anthony pulls me over, and these are things that I, I haven't really looked at in detail yet. I, I have been sort of unplugged for the last little while. I haven't been on social media a ton, and I, so I, I wasn't ready for this. But he, he, he pulls me over, and he goes, yeah, what do you, what do you think? And I'm just I'm like kind of looking at it. I'm like, I don't know. It looks kind of like, uh, kind of like an iMac, but like, you know, thicker and mac macier, iMac -ier. Sure. Um, and he goes, oh, yeah, well, what about like the power cable? Um, uh, and I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. And so I, so I'm like, oh, yeah, it's nicely braided. And I, I, I look at where it goes into the back of the machine. Machine. I'm like, yeah, the tolerances on the, uh, I don't know, on the plastic molding are pretty, pretty nice. I go sure. pull it out. It's like not coming out. I'm like, oh, is there like a locking mechanism or something? He's like, nope. I pull a little harder. The power cord is fixed. The six foot power cord. <laughs> don't know. Is, I thought this one was good. <laughs> is permanently attached to a thousand plus dollar product. I thought you said you liked this one. I thought it was one bad one, one good one. No, no, I was happy about the potential modularity of the Mac Studio. Oh. The studio display? That's an atrocity. <laughs> oh I man. Mean, hard wiring a monitor? It's been a long time since uh, I've I've had to do a cable repair. Are you actually stupid? <laughs> no, I, for serious though. No, that's really brutal. They even I, I don't get it. They at all. even engineered a MagSafe like power delivery system. Yeah, they have like they for the M1 iMac. They have some of the best cables in the industry. Lightning was a fantastic. There's no way that this MagSafe monitor draws more power than an entire computer <laughs> oh man and then it's so expensive and the amount of money that it would have saved <laughs> to make it like magsafe even <laughs> like nothing compared to the total cost that's amazing uh 
Oh, that's great. I just can't. I can't. Have you ever seen another hardwired monitor? Yes. Oh. Um, I have seen old CRTs. Um, I don't think they were hardwired for power, but I've seen, I believe, the VGA cable hardwired to a display really? before. Interesting. And it was stupid then. Yeah. And it's really stupid now yeah. because that was a long time ago. Is there is there any reason whatsoever? Like, is it compared to using like a regular C C thirteen or whatever the yeah. like standard power cable is? There could have been depth concerns plugging it in, but Apple already had shallower cables yeah. for their IMAX. They have MagSafe, and what's super cool about? No, I guess that wouldn't really benefit the uh, um, the studio display but a reason to do it other than other than just actually hating their own customers i mm -hmm. i don't i i can't think of one because why would you why would you put someone i mean in the okay. you think they're aside, trying to make it like actively dangerous to not get apple care aside from the aside from the technological advances of the last 30 years right uh, yeah there are other reasons that you would think Someone in that cappuccino sipping company would have come up with the the thought when they looked at this product and gone like they're based in Silicon freaking Valley, right? This is the center of the universe for alt work, like yeah. like standing desks and freaking like fancy ergonomics, okay? And they built a monitor that could potentially be incompatible with a standing desk. <laughs> I mean, Who's building out a fancy <laughs> office <laughs> with like, with ape caveman <laughs> desks that don't move up and down in Silicon Valley? <laughs> they're gonna they're gonna start selling like uh, desk mounting power bars. <laughs> Nobody at Apple thought of this. I have to be the one. Oh man. <laughs> oh, that's great. Sabin one thousand one says you can get an extension cable, Linus. Yeah, I could. How much is it? You know what? How much Hold is on. it? I'm gonna go get an extension cable that's gonna look great. Oh, they just with my new studio okay. display. One moment, please. Yeah, no problem. This is amazing. I actually had no idea this was a thing. He mentioned that he's been off social media. I haven't really been, uh, which, like, you know, maybe I should have. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> this goes perfectly with my setup. Wow! You know what's really in these days in trendy, you know, Web 3.0 <laughs> workspaces? Thick cord. Big, thick extension cables. This one has a lock on it. Space age technology. Unbelievable. This should really just be part of the decor here. One moment, please. Just gonna. This is this is what we're into now. This is this is peak trendy. Okay, we're just gonna have that there. Otherwise, how could we possibly run our monitors? Okay. Fan, fan, fantastic! <laughs> you want to know something even more fun? Oh, what's worse, Anthony's here. Anthony, every time I've talked to you today, I've ended up angry. So can you <laughs> can you just on. stop? Okay, come on, come on, come on over here. That come one's not us. on, so you'll yeah, that one's yeah. yeah. You'll have to come stand with me. Sup, Anthony? I looked it up. Apparently, Mac Rumors like reported on this, and they deleted the article. Are you serious? If you search for Sorry. Apple Studio Display removable cable or power cable, that's like the first thing that shows up in Google for me. Click on it, it's gone. Go uh go to my go to my screen. Go to my screen. Why? Mac rumors right here. PSA Studio Power Display cable is non-removable. Click. Page not found. Woo! <laughs> so that potentially indicates that they heard from Apple, because I can't think of any other reason that they would pull it down, unless they're like uncertain, unless they don't have one yet.
because I don't think Mac Rumors officially engages with Apple. Like, I don't think they actually seed them devices or anything like that because they report on leaks. Uh, is my understanding. I could be wrong about that. I, I haven't looked deeply into that. Um, I sanity checked just to be sure that they didn't remove it because it was wrong. I do not see a way to remove that cable. There is no button, no nothing. The cable is just there. Okay. okay. We got it. We got it. Um, yeah, float plane chat. Thanks, Tony. So, so just a, just a second here. Okay, well, let's let's read the article together, shall we? This is on uh, web.archive.org. Apple Studio Display features a built-in non-removable power cable on the back that even when attempted to be removed with force does not come out despite the Pro Display XDR featuring a removable power cable. British YouTuber Olier demonstrated the unique quirk about Apple's $1,600 starting price display in his review. Apple Studio Display also features non-interchangeable stands, meaning customers must choose which stand, including a vase mount adapter, they want upon checkout as it cannot be changed at a later date. It was made available for pre-order last week, so this is it. It's just a simple... Yeah, so they, just... they don't have one, though, is the answer to that. So they, they, were, they were making an article about a YouTube video. The only reason I can think of that they might pull it down is that Apple is angry about this coverage, but I wouldn't think Mac rumors would respond to that, so why? Don't know. And then if Apple's upset about this coverage, does that truly mean that they truly didn't realize this was a problem? You gotta wonder. Like, do you have kind of have to wonder how far up in an ivory tower an executive would have to be to not realize, like, fucking immediately upon seeing this product that this is a game-breaking issue that needs to be engineered, that a solution needs to be engineered for? I don't know. There's a there's a there's a tweet from at Reckless, also known as um, this is Verge, right? Yeah, editor in chief at the Verge, saying that he unplugged his display and he has a picture of it. But is this there's a difference, right? There was the what was it the the more expensive one had a removable cable, right? So is it possible that this is that? Ah. Uh... Wait, what? Hold on. Is Anthony still here? Can you grab him? Yeah. Can we bring the display? Yeah, let's do it. Mac rumors reported what they had seen. It was an early sample. Apple directly contacted them, said it was incorrect and wouldn't be that way. Okay. Wow. The plot thickens. The plot thickens a lot. Yeah. Because I pulled pretty hard. I don't even really like I'm looking at the I'm looking at this thing and I don't I don't even recognize this and I don't see how that seamlessly goes in there. Uh, we've got lots of questions in float plane chat. Uh, Nishloka says, why would Mac rumors outright delete the article rather than just issuing a correction? That is pretty weird. For sure. Uh-huh. Very interesting. Is it a twist and pull? Ooh, interesting question. Is it... <sighs> yeah. Okay. What does Nile say he has? I mean, it's it's got to. I, I I think that power cable looks the same. Like the really nice braiding on it looks the same. He says he has the studio display. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Apple Studio Display features not it. Yeah. Well, uh, it looks like they're going to take a minute to get over here. No, I don't have Mac Rumors in my phone list. I can't give them a call now, unfortunately. Uh, sorry. If anyone from Mac Rumors wants to reach out, I'd be happy to add you to my to my phone book. But it could be like the HomePod cable where it's not meant to be removed, but can. Okay, yeah. Actually, yeah. I didn't even think about the HomePod. Apple actually has a recent precedent for a move like this. 
just so ridiculous. Okay, I'm calmed down a fair bit now. It still should have been mag safe, obviously. Are you prepared like, to potentially break the monitor trying to pull it out? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm ready. All right. We're going to go for it. That was something I was a little worried about. I'm trying to see the, the shading in the photo is a little difficult, but it's it looks here? like it might be hey, a turn. Hey, sup, Jake Bellavance. Our producer is heading over here with the monitor. Okay, you ready, Luke? Yeah. Okay. Here, let me give you some space. Oh, okay. You want to do the honors? Me? Yeah. You can break more products? Uh, hold on. Let me just... Here we go. Uh... Okay, so you guys can you guys can see it here. Oh, okay, okay. That's why the picture looked weird because there's this oval hole in the stand. Okay, yeah. So the picture is taken through the stand. Taken through the stand because the stand is not removable, because you know. Okay, Luke's going for it. It doesn't feel good. <laughs> can I turn it? Like, can I grab it? Yeah, you can grab it. There's a here. There's just a little mouse pad here that you can use to kind of rest it on, so you don't scratch it or anything. I mean, scratching it might be the least of our concerns at this point. Maybe he's just super jacked. Uh, you could try twisting it, like try unscrewing it, maybe. The stand being in the way is super annoying. <laughs> Holy crap! Uh, I heard like the sound of things bending um, okay. and it did not come out. Now something I to feel note, like guys, pulling much harder is going to like, is that damage. any excuses Apple might have about ours being an engineering sample or whatever are, would be obvious bull spit because Apple doesn't seed us anything. And this is a retail unit that we purchased. It's hard to turn it because people my... say twisting will break the pins. How about try push it in? Push it in first. Maybe push it in and twist. I don't. There's no pushing in. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Support.apple.com. Important handling information for Apple Studio display. Note. Power cord is not. The removable. power cord is not removable. Well then. What is... Yeah, and like, you you can mess... I don't understand. Maybe he has the XDR? Or maybe he just has... Maybe he genuinely has, like, a weird unit? Or maybe he's just confused? Do you want to give it a shot? I can hold it. Um, it's It really doesn't feel like it's going anywhere, though. Like... Okay, yeah, I can... I'll take a shot at it, sure. I mean, should we just rip it off? That will. <laughs> I mean, we haven't uh, we haven't reviewed this yet. Maybe wait for then. Um. <clears throat> so uncomfortable. Okay. It's really hard with the stand there. Oh God. Okay. Got him. <laughs> I mean, that looks like the picture. Okay, uh, <laughs> it pulled out. I just had to give it a good two-hander. And I felt the frame flexing while you did that, to be clear. Like, this is not, it's, it's clearly not designed for that to happen. <laughs> Do you want to put it back in and see if it still works? Here. Huh. It's like, um... It's like a coil or a spring. Yeah, there's in like there. a metal spring that goes into this little groove here. Yeah. It's not glued. It's not glued. Nope. Nope. It's just a really, really tight fit. Like this is probably put in by machine. And you can actually see on the plastic where the screws, sorry, I can't really show it to you guys very well, but you can see on the plastic where the screws just like mangled the kind it's kind of like a flange here. And again, I felt the whole frame, the whole like metal frame of the monitor flex and strain under the pull. Like that was not a. Uh... And then what's really stupid is that putting Getting it, it back in, in it's like a is going to suck. Pain. It's keyed, so it only goes in one way. Probably need to press from here. 
Yeah, I got it. Oh. No, plugging it in is easy. Not too bad. Getting it out is hard. You want to try getting it out again or should, if, we, should we test it? But if Apple's official support documents specifically say the power cord is not removable, then I guess their intention would not be to provide longer alternatives? Yeah. Okay, let's see if it comes out easier the second time. That's what I was thinking. I mean, a little easier. Yes. So, is this not designed to be plugged and unplugged? Like, and because it... you said there was the wear that happened on it, right? Like, it might actually become less reliable. Well, no, I can see they're I can see they're they're spring loaded inside the 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 female receptacles. So, I would imagine it's fine. Uh huh. Oh, man. Plug it in, see if it works. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it'll probably work. Me too, but I think we should prove it. I kind of want you to plug it in. in with the extension cable just as like a... Yeah. yeah, yeah, it turns on. No problem. Okay. So stupid. So I guess our the title of this video is more true than we thought. Yeah. Why, like, what? Other than hating your customers, why? Can I don't you know. imagine being the engineering team designed to work on this? That's the thing you guys have to remember. Every Soul time, crushing. every time you see anything in the world, a team or an individual or a team of people worked on it. They set out with a goal, and they spent time and energy. The actual human life was invested to make this worse. To be consumer, to, to be anti-consumer. And to make sure that every power cable... Remember when Apple stood up on their soapbox and talked about how iPhones wouldn't come with lightning cables anymore because of concern about the environmental impact? Remember when they told the EU they couldn't change over from Lightning to USB-C on the iPhone because of concerns about all the cables that would end up in the landfill? This f***ing cable plugs into nothing but this display. And when this display is obsolete, it will go straight to the landfill. Good job. Good consistency, Apple. Brutal. Morons. Stable. Thanks, yeah. Bell. Get this out of my sight. <laughs> <laughs> Please. I don't mean to be rude to you. <laughs> Thanks, man. That was like, like the second time it was clearly less effort that had to go into it before it came out. But it was still like, I still felt the whole monitor strain. Like. All right. That's rough. Let's talk about something way cooler. Okay. The the bar for that's pretty low. But million dollar unboxing? Oh. The float plane team worked on a new feature for LTT store allowing us to embed videos. I suspect this wasn't one that was, you know, like a huge um no. a a huge amount of work. But basically, we now have Two pages, one for the screwdriver, one for the backpack, where we show the full details of these products. These are just in unlisted videos on YouTube and allow you to sign up for an email notification for when these products become available. That's right. They're finally just about here. So just because just I know some people from Shopify watch this, uh, just including the video where the images normally go is actually just supported by Shopify. Cool. All right. Yeah. Excellent. So we are we want to get an idea of whether people are more into the black or the black and orange color. There's still changes that we can make to which plastics we shoot at this stage. I am uh, extremely excited for people to get a chance to really see these products in detail. We haven't really shown them close up yet. Uh, is this uh, is this Andy's B-roll? I think Andy might have done these shots. In 
in if that's true, then freaking awesome. Anyway, you can pick a color and sign up to get an email when they're available. We still do not do... I just don't believe in taking your money for pre-orders. Uh, the reason for that is that there are still potentially things that can go wrong. And if we're going to say don't pre-order anything, then we need to, I think we need to walk that walk and not uh, solicit you guys to pre-order. Um, although it certainly would have <clears throat> removed some financial burden from this project. Love the bit storage, man. It's freaking awesome. Uh, let's get a closer look. We'll get a closer look at the orange, the orange top here. Absolutely quality plastics and molding. I think the part of the video where I talk about that's a little bit later, but we show how it's basically impossible to find the mold seam on on the handle bit. You can, if the light's right, like you can see it if you know what you're looking for, but the average person would not notice. It's just a really high quality mold. Right. Man, that's it right there. Is it glorious or what? Do you have one yet? No. Oh, man. Oh, man. Yes, it's expensive. But there's a lot of things about it that were expensive. There was a lot of tooling costs. Every one of these components is custom. We had to create molds for it. Oh, yeah. Here's a little, here's a little tip, Apple. Um, you know, there are situations <laughs> where there might be a functionality reason that you have to create something semi-proprietary. These bits are 20 millimeter, which is not a typical size for screwdriver bits in a multi-bit screwdriver. The reason we did it this way is that the less steel you have between the shaft magnet and the screw, the stronger the magnetic pull. It's got a super, super strong magnet. Makes sense. And it has shorter tips. So the bits will, I had it happen once now in like six months of using this driver where the bit comes out instead of the bit coming out of the screw, like after you've screwed something in, it's really good. Every other multi-bit screwdriver I've ever owned, it's like kind of a problem. It's really yeah. annoying. Yeah, it's really annoying. Um, and it, you can pick up, easily pick up screws and then, you know, reposition them when you're building a computer. Obviously it's built for building PCs, right? So we went with these 20 millimeter bits uh, the other reason for them was that we wanted the shaft to have a lower profile. And and to be clear, just because there might be some, mm -hmm. uh, you can use other bits. I'm getting to that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We wanted the shaft to have a lower profile than Mega Pro's other products, but we didn't want to give up the ability to store 12 bits in the driver handle. Now, we could have just not used this mechanism. We could have just gone like snap on and just had a screw off top and you just dump all the bits the inside. Hole. Yeah. But that... We we really liked this functionality. It has a really nice feel to it. It's almost like yeah. a fidget toy. Yeah. And we wanted 12 bits. We wanted this profile. And this is kind of an afterthought, the additional magnetism. But it was something I cared about a lot. I, I asked, I asked uh, engineering. I was like, look, uh, specifically Kyle, I talked to about this. I want the strongest possible magnet in there, the biggest diameter. And that was before we even talked about any of this. So we ended up with 12 millimeter bits which meant that we had to re-engineer something in order to maintain compatibility with standard bits because we care. We had to redo the mold for this in here. It used to be a circle. So it actually uh, sat in between the bottom and top bit storage. And the reason for that was to act as kind of a guide to make sure that they would stay in their own lane, right? Okay, yeah. We turned it into what we call the Ninja Star, and the reason for that is that it allows you to put a full length normal bit in here up to 40 whatever millimeters, um, 40 something. Uh, so it allows you to put a larger bit in here if you're willing to only accept six. And it'll just clip in on both the top and bottom pieces here. So you can engineer for improved compatibility or you can engineer for worse compatibility. There are actually two ways to do this. <laughs> Hex dot says Robertson bits, but no torques dot dot dot. We are going to have bit packs available at launch that will allow you to build any bit loadout you could possibly want. We're going to have pretty much everything for it. And they will be very reasonably priced because we know that the screwdriver is already a significant outlay for you guys. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we're we're super excited about people being able to have their own custom 12-bit loadout exactly the way that they like it. As for the backpack, 
Yeah, this one I'm super excited about. We know it's really expensive. We are well aware of that. This is a really high quality bag. I am absolutely jazzed for you guys to see this thing. Let's see if Fandy has done any of his a gorgeous a B roll on this one. 4K. Get that 4K. Oh, yes. You're going to have to watch the video. This one's like nine minutes long to get through all the details of what makes this thing special. But it's just carrying capacity, that's build sweet, quality. Though, if you're interested in this product, like that's exactly what I would want. Yep. I just kind of, I, basically, it's a what's in my bag video because <laughs> I've been using our latest sample of it for, I guess, not that long for this version of it, but I use every version of it. I just daily drive it so that I can bring feedback back to the team. Hey, this zipper pull is a little bit difficult. Uh, or, you know, I really found I didn't end up using this pocket. If it was easier to reach, that would be way better. This zipper should go the other way. Just little things like that that I try and try and get back to them about as we have made our way through the many, many revisions of this product. Orange inside, that's for you, Luke. Yeah. <laughs> I know you're a fan. I actually just love that so much. So yeah, it's $249.99 US. It's a lot of money. But we believe that it's competitive with bags that are a lot more expensive than that. Yeah. Yeah. So is that, so what, did that have something to do with million dollar unboxing or was that just its own nope. topic? Nope. That was just okay. a more, more better topic that I would rather talk about than, than Apple just being mean and rude to their customers. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. I uh I there's something wrong with my laptop. I cannot open any additional pages. Oh um, cool. <laughs> but but <laughs> should we should we do like like three to five merch messages real quick? Uh yeah, we should. Yeah. Oh shoot. I did not reload the page. I guess I don't need to. You're probably yeah, fine. Yeah, this seems fine. Cool. Yeah. Spicy Olive says podcast consumer here. Can't wait to see this message in four days. <laughs> <laughs> Sup, spicy olive. <laughs> Thanks for making Toronto traffic more bearable. What was it that you used in your house again that was proprietary? And have you solved your signal conversion to Home Assistant? I haven't yet. It's an American standard heat pump system, and Jake and I have some work to do on that. Drew L. Love the WAN show? Hey, me too. I'm finishing a basement soon. One room will be an office slash gaming room and one the main TV kids area. Any tips on a decently priced sound system for the play area? Any general suggestions for the office gaming room? Man, wow, that's a really open-ended question. Decently priced sound system. I mean, really, I would say the most decently priced sound system you're going to find is secondhand. Speakers are an area of technology where there has absolutely been advancement, especially on the very high end. And I would say on the low end, there's actually been a fair bit of advancement. Oh, like, yeah. like fifty dollar in ears are a lot better today than they were when I was in high school. Yeah. <laughs> but in the mid range, yeah, there's been advancement, absolutely. But if you find a really nice pair of speakers from like ten years ago, they're still really nice speakers. So. I would say that if it's the if it, if it's going in like the TV slash kids area, I would either go you know simplicity right. The last thing you want is kids tripping over a cable or whatever else. Sure. And I would get like knocking a, over a speaker stand. Yeah, I would get a decent sound bar. Sound bars are an area that have improved a lot in the last bit. I'm really impressed with the Sonos Arc, although it's very expensive. It sounds amazing for a sound bar. I like hated sound bars when they first came to market. Mm -hmm. They were they're, awful. They're great now. Sony has a super cool product. We did a sponsored video, so take this for what it is. They're not sponsoring anything about what I'm saying right now. Um, but Sony did a uh, Sony sponsored a video on their what's it called HT A9 or something like that. But it's it's a sound bar that has no bar. You just put four speakers around the room, and they do a calibration with each other, and you can kind of put them anywhere. You don't have to. So if you have one like kind of a little to the left and this one kind of way out to the right, and then these two are kind of at the back, they just do some some DSP funkery and try to compensate for the size and shape of the room. So if you want surround, Funky. that's a really cool way to go. If you're just thinking like music, like ambient music or putting on kids songs, um, picking up an old Sono amp, uh, but one that is still compatible, getting the oldest one that's compatible with the S2 version of the app, 
or is it called S2? I can't remember. But the, the newer replaced version of the app is another little pro tip. I got some for cheap on eBay. I did a video about that when I put in ceiling speakers in my house. You can find that one. What else can I, what else can I really say at this point? I don't know. Um, your, your dad's old speaker equipment is probably still good. Yeah, that's a that's a really good way to go. Man, don't buy a receiver new if you don't need the latest, you know, HDMI version or whatever else. Like if you just if you just want amplification, you can get super high end receivers from many years ago that have just ballin' amplifiers in them, but don't support the latest Atmos. And if you're just trying to drive a, like a nice pair of bookshelves, man freaking awesome i still run linus's old one uh yeah yeah i know you do <laughs> <laughs> there you go that's i guess what i have to say about that uh any general suggestions for the office gaming room make sure you put in enough ethernet never never don't put in enough ethernet that's one thing i'll say matthew s been watching since the 10 series launch. Looking to start my own GPU repair company sometime soon. What advice would you have for starting a small tech shop? Love the show. Good question. Um, s equipment, no matter how expensive it is, is not expensive. Staff is expensive. Like, do you know how much Luke a Luke costs to employ for 10 years? You know, I'm, I'm serious though. Compared to any piece of equipment that I've been using for the last 10 years, Luke is, wow, anything I've been using for the last 10 years. So like the most expensive, Luke is a solid two orders of magnitude more. Obviously, Luke has improved, you know, he's aged like fine <laughs> wine, whereas equipment ages more like milk, right? Yeah, a little worse. But it's something to understand is that adding headcount to a business adds to your monthly expenses and adding equipment adds to your capabilities without adding ongoing monthly expenses. That is, unless it's software and the company that you're engaging with has figured out software as a service. Eh. <laughs> that's a whole that's a whole other separate conversation. Yeah. But that's something that, you know, I think any small business owner or startup should absolutely keep in mind. Um you know, don't overdo your space. Think space efficient, right? Use your vertical space. Don't spread out horizontally. That's another thing. Getting a space that's too big is absolutely something that you should avoid as a, a small business. Yeah. You can always move. Um, what else could we what could and, and we while, say? And while equipment and machines and whatever has maintenance cost, uh, employees generally expect raises. But at the same time, if you don't have anyone helping you, if something happens to you, even if it's temporary, say you get knocked down with, uh, with long COVID or whatever, right? And you get knocked out for two weeks to a month. If you have customer orders in the shop, if you have GPUs, because you're trying to fix GPUs, if you have GPUs in the shop and you are unable to fix them and you don't have anyone working with you that can fix them, that's going to be really rough for your company. And be creative. Don't be afraid to pick up stuff secondhand on you know, Craigslist yeah. or Facebook Marketplace. Like uh, a drawer is a perfect way to store GPUs for things that are in progress. And cardboard is a great way to build a custom divider system for a drawer that you can slot them into vertically so that you can fit more. Just lots of, lots of little things. Be scrappy, be creative. Uh, don't overdo it right out of the gate. Let it, let it grow, let it become sustainable. Those are... Those are all things that can give you a much better shot at success. Let's do one more and then we'll do our next topic. Sure. Uh, Dustin asks, I was curious if you guys saw Corridor Crew's AI voice video last week. What are your thoughts on this tech? Any plans to automate sponsor spots? I didn't see their video, but I did see, um, uh, I was chatting with Tom Scott about a tool that he's been using that actually allows you to edit according to a transcript of the video. And if you make a small mistake, use AI voice recognition to fix it. Oh, wow. Yeah, to, to just fix it in post. Wow, that's nuts. Which is really cool. Um, oh, that's awesome. We don't have any plans to automate our sponsor spots or anything like that, but I am, I am absolutely into machine learning accelerated 
uh, video and audio techniques these days. Like you guys saw the upscaling video that we uploaded earlier this week, probably where we took the first NCIX Tech Tips video and we tried to upscale it to 4K. Turns out there just weren't enough pixels. <laughs> it ended up being nightmare fuel, but yeah, with something that's like 720p source, man, the results are kind of amazing. You don't have to be a hundred person you know, digital art studio these days to generate those kinds of results. It's, it's just, it's really cool. Let's move on to our next topic, shall we? Yeah. Do you want to talk about million dollar unboxing? I do. What is it? Okay. We have been working on this project for over a year. And the genesis was Kyoxia, formerly Toshiba. Yeah, yeah, okay. Kioxia yeah. flash memory and SSDs. Kioxia wanting to sponsor some kind of prod cool project. And I just I threw out an absolute just long shot. Long shot idea. Because one of the things that was more commercial slash enterprise storagey that we did that was really successful was the petabyte project. Right where we deployed yeah. a petabyte of storage across two 45 drive storinators. Problem is, Kyoxia doesn't make hard drives. Kyoxia makes SSDs. So I was like, uh, man, you know what we should do? We should do a server with a petabyte of flash. And they were like, okay. <laughs> but here's the thing. You can't just put a petabyte worth of SSDs yeah. in a server. Yeah. Right? You can't just you can't just buy like NVMe JBODs and just <laughs> stack more SSDs. You would the by the time you installed that many SSDs, you'd be getting a small fraction yeah. of the maximum performance because no CPU exists with enough PCIe lanes and enough compute to run that kind of data through it like so we it required it required partnership with amd uh who provided a total of 512 epic cpu cores across all of the cpus 512 cores okay the oh. whole thing has literally terabytes of ram terabytes of ram okay We've got uh, eight NVIDIA A100s. So those are, what are they, like 400 watts each or something like that? They're, they're AI accelerators. <laughs> uh, a total of seven servers, a petabyte of flash, obviously a custom power solution because the whole thing sucks like 10,000 watts. We, we didn't have anything to plug it into. Uh, and Jake and I unboxed it. And the idea is that we should be able to get at least close to the maximum theoretical performance of our flash array. That's insane. By, <laughs> by architecting it this way. Uh, Super Micro was involved. Uh, Micron was involved. Uh, I think, yeah, I already mentioned NVIDIA. Uh, Infinite Cables had to build a custom cable for us for, for just to power it, to, <laughs> to plug into the only like 30 amp, 240 volt plugs that we have for our machinery in the shop. It's wild. Uh, oh, uh, Infinite Cables also built us a fiber optic cable to run from the shop to our server room so we could actually like edit off of it. Obviously, we're not even going to touch the capabilities of this thing. We're going to have to do like some AI benchmarks and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be a whole series of videos, but I am <laughs> so excited. Gone to our info plane chat was like, Linus causes the singularity. <laughs> yeah, I'm so excited. This will be beyond a shadow of a doubt, the most powerful hardware that I have ever touched and probably will touch for the next three to five years. It's insane. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's raw, but someone's asking one petabyte usable or raw? Uh, I don't know yet. I guess we'll find out. Wow. Yeah. I'm, I'm not actually sure. It's been a long time since the last call I was on. Jake has done most of the coordination on this project. Okay. Oh, man. Yeah, I'm I'm absolutely jacked, though. Jacked. Uh, Bean710 asks, do you get to keep it? Are you kidding me? 
Keoxia might leave us with some drives, but beyond that, no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, that'd be awesome, but no. Oh man, the uh, the switch that ah, uh, sorry, not Mellanox, <laughs> Nvidia. They acquired them. The switch that Nvidia sent over, network switch, does multiple terabits per second of switching. <laughs> terabits. <laughs> multiple terabits that's pretty wild how long do you know how long you're gonna be able to keep it for i don't know there's no there's no firm end date for when we absolutely sure. have to box everything back up and send it back yeah it takes up a lot of space they sent over an entire rack to house the thing <laughs> well right because i mean it makes sense it's just yeah it's just nuts. one u of switching we've got six u's of of one u dual dual socket epic servers then we have a 4U that contains two more Epic servers, uh, two terabytes of RAM, the eight A100s. Like, this thing is knocking futs. And I'm so jazzed. I'm so jazzed. You guys are going to love it. Whole series of videos. So the first video is us just basically uncrating the thing. You wouldn't believe how much the compute unit weighs. I could not believe it. It weighs as much. It weighs like it's full of hard drives. <laughs> okay. But it's just full of heat sinks. Yeah, I was going to say just metal. It's just, <laughs> it is metal AF. I love it. That's awesome. Uh, Charlie says, that system might be an awesome contribution to an educational institution. Guys, I'm not, it's not He's mine. Not, it's not his to give away. It is not mine. Yeah. And I don't think these companies are probably interested in just handing that hardware over to f for free to anyone. I suspect they'll end up being trade show models yeah. so that they're able to do demos and, and yeah. stuff like that. This stuff doesn't just... Like, it's it's actually... I believe the sticker price is somewhere in the neighborhood of a million dollars for this, for this setup. It's utterly insane. I don't know bonkers. if it's actually a million dollars because we don't know. There's no retail price for any of this stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> Honestly, there being no retail price probably makes me assume that it's uh, even more. Because anytime you get custom stuff done, it's super expensive. I mean, the engineering that went yeah. into making this whole thing run at that kind of speed. Well, like I said, we could have easily just put NVMe SSDs into an enclosure. And just had and it not had really work very well. Yeah, yeah, and had it limp along at, you know... Yeah. <laughs> A hundred gigabytes a second or whatever, you know, but <laughs> which sounds cool, which is a lot, but, but this comparatively is do... to what it should be able to do, it's like exactly. nothing. Exactly, this yeah. is going to do way more. Yeah. Linus, you must buy it. Don't send it back. If I spent a million dollars on a petabyte of SSD storage that consumes up to ten thousand watts which obviously we have to pay for power for, my wife would probably divorce me. <laughs> she wouldn't, actually. Speaking of ways to not she'd get divorced. She'd be furious. Um, she would be bothered. really mad. She'd be like the kind... She'd be quiet mad. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. That's scary. Like, that's not even... You that's not even, that. yeah. Yvonne and I don't have a relationship that's like, you know, you do a thing wrong and you get divorced. I mean, neither of us has ever even slept on the couch. Like we have a, you resolve something until it is resolved and then you move on from it kind of relationship. Um, but she'd be really mad. <laughs> Super mad. Yeah. She'd be mad. Uh, sorry, what do you want to do? Sponsors. Oh yeah. Yeah. But she'd be mad if I didn't, if I didn't talk about our sponsors exactly. too. Exactly. Got to talk about them sponsors. The show is brought to you by Squarespace. If you're looking at creating and sharing your own content online, give Squarespace a try. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform for building a top-tier website and growing your brand. You can upload or embed your video library and organize it in one of Squarespace's best-in-class templates to explore the new ways that you can monetize your content. You can both display your social media content and push website content out to your channels. Plus, with their member areas, you can unlock a whole new revenue stream for your videos by allowing you to post exclusive content behind either a subscription or a one-time fee. And Squarespace's analytics and insights ensure that you're optimizing your website every step of the way. So go to squarespace.com forward slash when and get 10% off today. Luke, you're going to have to do the next read because G Suite signed me out in the middle of a sponsor read. 
Okay. Jump Cloud. If you've been in IT for any length of time, you probably know how important community is to just many of us. It brings us together like our love of bacon, sci-fi, and gaming do. It's this is the, some weird talking this is the official sponsor read uh it's part of our dna jump cloud knows this and wants to give back to it admins by creating a forum that welcomes and encourages the sharing of ideas asking of questions and connecting with others in the new jump cloud it community we have spaces to talk about the big it topics hardware software network security and best practices and as the discussions grow so will the topic areas and you can suggest more there's a lot to navigate in today's IT career. Come talk with your peers about navigating changes, keeping up to date, and networking. See our career spotlight and advice columns launching next month at community.jumpcloud.com or at the link below. Finally, the show is brought to you by NordPass. Do you use your Facebook or Google account to log into every new website or app you visit? It might seem faster and easier, but what happens if Facebook or Google, you know, have suffer some kind of breach and your account gets compromised? Hmm, yeah, that's actually a very good question. Anyone who gains access to that account could have free access to dozens of other accounts too. NordPass can help you avoid a situation like this by helping you create unique, secure passwords, or passphrases really is what you should be using, for all of your accounts online. It'll recognize your favorite sites and autofill your information, and their built-in password generator helps you make new complex passwords. You can easily import passwords saved by your web browser, which is also, don't, don't please don't just save in your web browser, or import CSV files from your old password manager. You can access your login credentials on any device, even when you're offline, and it features data breach alerts, password health reports, and up to six active devices. For added security, NordPass uses zero-knowledge architecture, so your data is encrypted on your device before it reaches NordPass's servers for backup and sync. So get 70% off a two-year NordPass premium plan with an extra month for free at nordpass.com slash WAN, and make sure you use code WAN to take advantage of a limited-time offer. Man. I just feel spent, you know? Like, this topic, this is all the notes on this, guys. Apple lied and is dumb. But just... <laughs> I just... I've used up so much of the energy that I had for the show today. We're just going to have to just chill. Yeah, we got to chill. We got to chill for a little bit. Yeah. I think the remaining topics are pretty chill. Okay. Um, you want to start us off on something cool? Xbox Cloud, Cloud Gaming Beta on Steam Deck today. Yeah. Uh, Microsoft cool. announced a beta version of Microsoft Edge for the stream, Steam Deck. Uh, I'm always, I'm always trying to say Stream Deck. I know uh, that it will enable Xbox Cloud Gaming with Xbox Game Pass Ultimate on the device. That's huge. Microsoft yeah. uploaded comprehensive directions showing users how they can install Microsoft Edge and enable, of course, you have to install freaking Edge, uh, and enable Xbox Cloud Gaming. You didn't expect them to be totally naughty. Uh, <laughs> right, just like, come on. I have a Linux device. Do I really need Edge to follow me onto this Linux device? Come on. Um, there are quite a few steps to configure it, including some command line typing, wow, and shortcut making to put it on the front screen. Uh, related slightly earlier this week. Oh, right. Yeah. Google product director Greg Hartel announced that the Steam on Chrome OS alpha launched, despite it not being ready for testing and also despite it probably not working on most Chrome OS devices, but sure, it's coming. Yeah. And there's a discussion topic here to talk about. Uh, does Cloud gaming on the Steam Deck actually make it more compelling. Is Microsoft's aggressive push to put Xbox Cloud gaming everywhere uh, going to pay off, especially when the Steam Deck is uh, kind of sold on the hardware that can run games locally? Well, the Steam Deck, in my opinion, while Valve does focus on running games locally, in my, from my experience using it, it's such a compelling device for local gaming network gaming and cloud gaming that it's all the above yeah i think it's Why just all more? of the above yeah. yeah like steam oh, i can never remember what the, it used to be called steam in home streaming so that's what i'm gonna call it works great on the deck like great the h264 or i don't know if it's h264 or h265 actually i should check that um but whatever their hardware decode is on that custom chip from amd is great the latency is great uh, you know i played halo infinite on it competitive shooter and besides you know crappy joystick controls yeah yeah, yeah. it was great um and you know the same can be said of something like 
Xbox Cloud Gaming. Yeah, you're adding latency. Absolutely. But Cloud Gaming will continue to improve and yes. it could easily get to the point where we're only talking another couple of frames of latency and it could be ba it could be better than playing on an old flat panel TV, honestly. And and I think to the core question, does Cloud Gaming make the Steam Deck more compelling? Maybe not to you as an individual, but I guarantee you it does for someone. For the mainstream? Absolutely. <laughs> One thing that I really hope is that this doesn't become an excuse for companies that have Cloud Gaming offers to not push to make their games more compatible with being natively played on Linux, aka SteamOS mobile gaming. That would really frustrate me if this ends up becoming a reason that oh, gaming on Linux doesn't game. experience its big, big renaissance. Yeah, that would be genuinely very frustrating. So I hope that's not the case. But if that's not the case, then yeah, why not? Being able to do more stuff on it sounds great. I don't see any negative towards that i'm not a huge fan of that type of stuff I, I don't like subscription services for games i like owning my individual games um i might play a game on launch and it's pretty fun and then i get distracted by something else or busy or whatever and then i can't play again for yep. another year and i don't want to buy another subscription to be able to play that game that i already paid a subscription to be able to play in the first place like i find that very frustrating so um yeah, it's not a huge thing for me personally, but I like that it's an option because, I mean, I know people that use cloud gaming services. Yeah, especially if you use Game Pass. Game Pass is an amazing value. Like, it is. I can't, I can't say it enough. It's an amazing yeah. value. Yep. Just wait until, you know, wait, wait a few more years, right? Netflix used to be an amazing value. All yep. your content in one place with one low fee. Now Netflix is like over 20 Canadian dollars and doesn't include content out. from anyone else. And some of the other providers are starting to bundle together their services. It's becoming a cable package again. Yep. Ah! Yeah, it's brutal. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Options. Options are cool. Why well, don't have more options? Uh, we can probably skip that topic because it, it's just lame. Which uh, one? The Dr. Disrespect one? Yeah. Oh, we're talking about that. Okay. But you first, want to talk about, or, uh, yeah, first, I want to talk about AMD confirms ah. no overclocking support on the Ryzen 7 5800X 3D. That's right. AMD's hotly anticipated 5800X 3D, the first production CPU with 3D vCache technology, now has a release date and a dark portent of things to come. This is definitely written by Anthony. Yes, it was. <laughs> it's essentially a 5800X, 8-core 16 threads, but with lower core clocks and a mind-boggling 96 megabytes of level 3 cache, up from just 32. AMD says the extra cache is meant to improve performance with discrete GPUs, although it's not clear how it will interact with the recently released direct storage API and future titles that will take advantage of it. Oh, by the way, we have a video coming about that that we just shot today. Anthony researched uh, and shot it, so he'll be hosting it. Before we get to doom and gloom, I want to insert one note that's further on in the doc that says AMD promises that this is a one-time limitation for this specific SKU, and it will be overcome by uh, the time future 3D vCache CPUs launch. Mm -hmm. So this is, a, I mean, it kind of feels like this product Remember is like a... Uh, is, uh, like a stopgap solution. Yes. Like, uh, like a Frankenstein, just, okay, we wanted we wanted That's something to getting. respond to the 12900K, and this is going to be it. It's going to be available for 450 US dollars on 420. <laughs> nice. And AMD says it will be the new world's fastest gaming CPU, but it will also be the first consumer Ryzen chip that won't be overclockable. Which, again, is a little rough, but... So the reason for this is that, wow, you can't even change the voltage. Nope. The reason for this is that the cache needs a strict voltage limit of 1.35 volts. Interesting. Infinity fabric and memory overclocking is still supported. So you could push your memory speed super hard. Very interesting. Which does matter. I mean, the reality of it is, Traditional overclocking on Ryzen is kind of a dead meme anyway. Like, it doesn't do much. AMD already is redlining these chips out of the box depending for the on, most part. Depending on how you want to define it, traditional overclocking is just dead in general. Yeah, and Intel is redlining things pretty hard as well. I mean, at least they still have all the levers and dials, and you can turn them if you want, but it might result in instability and, like, uh, heat that cannot be overcome by, by mere mortal coolers. <laughs> 
Uh, AMD also announced a number of other CPUs to go alongside the 5800X3D, and these are going to make things really interesting in the budget range because we've got everything from four core, <laughs> four core, four gigahertz boost uh, Zen 2 chips for $99 to Zen 3 six cores for a $199. That 5600 is looking real spicy. Actually, 4600G with uh, $154 for Zen 2 cores, six of them, and Vega 7 graphics. That's pretty interesting, too. I really wish they were RDNA 2, but I guess we'll have to wait a little longer for that. Discussion question. Is overclocking basically dead? Yeah, we made our way there. Uh, thanks, <laughs> Anthony, though. And yeah, kind of. Should we get a Seuss or someone to make us a... Yes, this will fry your CPU BIOS so we can overclock it anyway. How long before a modified BIOS does just this? Well, based on that, AMD had to request that motherboard manufacturers remove overclocking capabilities for the CPU. Clearly, they existed. They were there. And caused point. some kind of reliability issue. So, I mean, the question that that sort of raises for me is, is this CPU going to be very reliable? Because... Increasing the voltage makes it die sooner, but does it does it have the same kind of reliability we've come to expect from AMD processors? I wonder. I feel like probably. If you could get your hands on a motherboard without the limitations, it would be kind of fun to do like a, we're going to stream until this thing is dead stream. Oh, wow. That would be, <laughs> that would be kind of hilarious. <laughs> I have another impromptu topic of conversation. Okay. Our fiber over the air internet yeah. connection slash, well, it's really, it's a network connection because they also access our internal infrastructure over it. But the uh, fiber over the air solution that we set up for Creator Warehouse went down. But I was still right <laughs> because the reason it went down had nothing to do with Ubiquiti's dishes and everything to do with the fact that um, Jake scrounged together SFP to RJ45 adapters, like modules, that were not technically specced for quite the distance of our runs. Oh. And so it flaked out. So we replaced it with ones that were specced for the right distance, and it has been back up and running smoothly okay, ever since. Okay, sweet. Yeah. So, I, man, I am so stoked on not having to just buy a new internet connection for that place for no reason, and the fact that it's faster, <laughs> and the fact that just with zero pain whatsoever, they have to complete access to our internal infrastructure. Like, for their computers, they just plugged them in over there, plugged them into the wall, and they might as well have been in the same building. Having, so cool. Having, like, local networking across multiple buildings without being a campus is just like super sick. That's awesome. I know, right? Yeah. We're going to really do it for cool. the lab too. Yeah, that's put sweet. another dish on the roof. <laughs> Heck yeah, boys. We're going to have like we're going to have like eight dishes yeah. on the roof of the main <laughs> yeah. building at some point. <laughs> And oh, then, maybe. oh man, oh man, when we have like a bigger office someday, we'll have to make sure that it has line of sight to this one, right? Put like a big tower on the top of it, right? You're gonna and end then, up having buildings that look like research centers. We'll have like, like yeah, two. we'll have multiple hops because we'll we'll do, we'll have all the storage at the main one, and we'll just we'll have like offsite satellite storage. All that. Oh, it's gonna be amazing. Nice. Under parking lot, dark fiber. When? Uh, okay, so. I don't know if we actually talked about it in the rooftop air fiber video, but I think conceivably it could be possible to stealth bury an armored fiber cable between here and the lab and do like 25 gig from here to there. You probably could. Yeah, you could probably get away with that. If you like showed doing that, that might be, you know, not great. But you could probably get away with it. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be sweet. Yeah. So um, it doesn't the, really harm or bother anybody. The hard part is getting from the green belt to that building. Oh, because you're on the. Yeah. Um, We're like buried in the middle of the building. But mm. if we could somehow stealthily get it up to the roof. Oh, you totally could. You still could. I have an idea. You totally could. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, I know you definitely Just tell could. me, because it's going to be in the video anyway, so we're going to get caught. Uh, do you know those how they, like, repair road lines? Mm -hmm. You could asphalt over it. Okay, I thought of that, but getting up the building. 
Yeah, I mean that's probably fine because once once you're actually against the building, it's mm-hmm. gonna look like 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 it's supposed to be there. Yeah, like there's this whole mm-hmm. concept in <laughs> there's this whole concept in guerrilla infrastructure that once something is there, as long as it looks like it belongs there, everyone's no just gonna it. assume it belongs there. Right. Like a lot of people actually just start using things as if they were intended to be there, even if they had nothing to do with putting it there and it wasn't supposed to be there. Right. So like if you run a cable up the side of the building, as long as yeah. it looks properly installed, potentially even painted the same color as the building or right. something like that, no one's going to mess with it. So we go get a couple of little like chips. Oh, oh okay. Ganja Gremlin says, look into micro trenching. We do that from time to time with my company. Oh, interesting. The pros and cons of micro trenching. That's a little spooky because that is, uh, that could potentially be seen as like actually damaging pre existing infrastructure. Mm hmm. Uh, wow. All right. Anyway, yeah. Um, it's almost all soft ground from our building to there. Yeah. Which is why we think it might actually, There's might actually There's very work. little non-soft ground. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know, we'll see. Uh, Theorica says, be careful if you're gonna do any digging, you can get in a ton of trouble. Uh, stuff that isn't buried too deep that you definitely do not want to damage. So yeah, so if we use an armored cable, that's another thing. Nobody walks back there ever. Yeah. It is actually conceivable that we could just lay it on the ground. It yeah. could get damaged, but like, oh well. We'll have our we'll have air fiber as a backup anyway. So, so Kasama and Twitch chat, just get a real long Ethernet cable. It would be it would be beyond the range. Yeah, I think could, I don't yeah. think you'd want to bury it. I think yeah. you'd want to kind of run it along things and try to keep its route managed and then make sure that there's like brush or whatnot so that people wouldn't want to walk there you know we'd have to make sure that we we'd have to make sure we're wearing like like safety vests while we install it and like hard hats just like have a clipboard yeah just like look super official yeah yeah we'll see we'll see we'll get a little dirty ahead of time wear a toque ganja gremlin says it's not that armored squirrel squirrel ella's uh squirrel as whatever chew through it all the time i think you mean squirrels <laughs> true scott says go through the sewers thanks true scott really helpful thanks for taking participating in floatplane chat appreciate you if this was a video <laughs> game they would do it that way i swear like almost every video game you end up going through a sewer somehow yeah it's so weird i don't know i know right i mean the last thing man more immersive gaming can't come late enough for sewer levels <laughs> When they have smell a vision <laughs> for sewer levels, it's gonna oh. <laughs> oh boy. Make sure you encrypt your traffic over it. Someone could cut and get into your network. Yep, that's good advice. Absolutely. absolutely. Yep. Anything that's accessible like that, you would absolutely want to encrypt. But that shouldn't be a problem. It would still be way faster. Like way faster than um than even fiber over the air, which we got. Uh, it's weird. We think it's because it's an early access product from Ubiquity, but we got one gigabit down and three gigabits up. And it should be like symmetric. Yeah. So, yeah, we're not really sure what's yeah, up with odd. that. Okay. Dr. Disrespect. We're doing it. Dr. Disrespect. Developing an FPS game, which we knew already, right? Yeah. That will give. And will give fans the chance to win an opportunity to buy an NFT. Which the the, the whole like last two thirds of that aside, as far as my understanding goes, before streaming, he used to be a level designer. Oh yeah, it goes into it right now. Uh, so he used to be a level designer his for FPS. New games. game studio is Midnight Society. Okay, it was co-founded by the streamer. Um, former uh, Call of Duty creative strategist Robert Bowling and Halo 5 multiplayer designer Quinn Del Hoyo. While literally no other details have been revealed about the upcoming first-person shooter, we do know that the game will contain everyone's favorite feature, NFTs. The company promises that the game will be the most community-focused online PvP multiplayer experience the world has ever seen. Whew. 
They hope to use the collective strength of the community to go hands-on during crucial early development milestones. Typically, game studios will pay employees to do alpha and beta testing and QA, but Midnight Society is graciously offering a select group of 10,000 community members a $50 Founders Access Pass, so that's a cool half a million dollars, that will provide access to early builds, Discord channels, and the chance to vote on key design decisions. So, pause for a second. I understand that we are against this general concept, but I would like to say the way that this is written is very inflammatory when this is not this is actually very standard practice these days. This is not like this is not like whoa. These guys figured out that you get people to pay to test your game. What? Like that's been happening for a long time. So okay, I just want to make that clear that this is super normal so far. The pass holders will also be able to mint a unique, procedurally generated, tradable visor design. No longer normal. With differing <laughs> levels of rarity. They just put NFTs and loot boxes and paid early access together. Let's go. It's like <laughs> it's like one middle finger wasn't enough. They gave you all three, three, three middle, middle fingers. fingers. <laughs> they grew another <laughs> arm just to give you another middle finger. Oh, man. Beautiful. These will be created using environment-friendly NFT technology. So. Ah, good. Not I mean, Ethereum. And purchasers will be able good. to sell their stupid pass on marketplaces after a 30-day lockdown period. Okay, who wrote this? Oh, it's uh, it's uh, our new writer who's not off probation yet. Okay, uh, that's a little, that's too much color commentary in a news story, it, okay, AS? It is very clear that the person that read, wrote this does not like it. Super nonplussed. Yeah. Super nonplussed. The Founders Pass will not be first come, first served. Instead, you get to apply for the chance to pay them for this <laughs> <laughs> bullshit vaporware. <laughs> the application process, I'm not even changing the colorful writing here. Yeah. <laughs> the application process is live and applicants will be judged on various criteria, including but not limited to seniority in the community, activity in the community, how active of a gamer or creator or developer they are in general, and their vision for what makes a good PvP shooter. Okay. Founders Pass holders will also get first priority in par being part of an elite class of rulers within the game and company who get to decide on future items and assets that will be included and sold in the game. Hopefully they get to mint more of them because they're making this sound like an investment, which is just, that's brilliant. You know what the worst part it's is? really smart. Is that Dr. Disrespect is going to be a billionaire off this project. Oh, it's going to be huge. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. So... Should we just like, can I be a billionaire, please? Can we just embrace this? No. Okay. I'll disown you. I know. I disown me. <laughs> just sucks. Like, <laughs> pyramid schemes seem like an extremely good way to make money. They're so easy, yeah. I know. I'm trying to find... Um, Jaden's all mad. Jaden, you'll develop what I tell you to develop. <laughs> I feel like if you got him to make NFTs, that might not actually be the case. I think he might just quit. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. I'm trying to find... I know on the Linus Tech Tips Twitter account, there was something posted very recently. Here it is. Um, it's a the picture of the guy wearing Beats, and it says, I bought these headphones. Sure, yeah, yeah. Picture of the guy wearing Beats, I bought these headphones for their looks. The response is, that's absolute nonsense in 2010. And then picture of a dude who bought a mouse and this mouse has three times more RGB than any other mouse. And then the response is, I'll take two. I feel like this is this is like in a lot more spaces than just hardware. Like I, I think back then, the purchasing of skins in game, like think of horse armor, right? Horse armor. The reaction to horse armor was super negative. Yep. Now, if you look at um, Lost Ark, people are frustrated that the North American version doesn't have enough cosmetics to buy in the store. They want more of the purchasable cosmetics to come from the, I believe, Korean version of the game uh, into the North American one because they're like, dude, I can't buy enough stuff. This is really frustrating. And that has been just, I, I think, honestly, seeing that happen and seeing the community in general just be like, yeah, true, has made me, that was one of the strongest, most like, I'm a boomer moments I've pretty much ever had. It's like, because to me, that's just so wrong. 
Yeah. My kids will not buy in-game cosmetics. It's crazy. If they do, I will literally kill their allowance forever. There's some stuff, like if it's a completely free, like in League of Legends, if people are like, I play this game a ton and it's completely free and I want to like show some support to the devs, I don't mind that. When people spend like two grand on cosmetics in League of Legends, which absolutely happens. I know more than one person who has done that personally. That's when I'm like, dude, what are you doing? It's time to stop. Yeah, like, come on. And to be clear, I'm not talking game functionality, right? Like if you buy, like I know uh, League of Legends has like a character rotation for the ones that you can play for free, right? Yeah. Yeah, so if you buy a character that you really like to play, that's at least more akin to an expansion pack. It's actual functionality. And it's a, it's a free game, right? Yes. Th that's another important part to add on top of this. It's a free game. Um, and Lost Ark is a free game. They do have like a monthly thing. My silent that protest that is that when I play Halo Infinite, which I'm not right now because I'm doing all my gaming on Steam Stick Deck. on the default skin. I, I play gray. Default Chad, dude. Default default gray yeah i won't even i won't even use the ones that i earn for free and it looks i don't know it looks good i i don't really understand yeah i don't know so there's a few more notes from um the new writer discussion question mm. this is so stupid they are selling a monetization scheme and then promising the game will be good i hate this so much is decentralizing game development just a new attempt to avoid paying employees for work this uses all the classic scam rhetoric Get in on the ground floor. Just one small investment in the future. Decentralized. Buy now or miss out. Why did you make me read and write about this, Linus? Why? That's not really how the discussion that's, questions are supposed to work. That's uh, quite writer. an extensive statement. Yeah. So. <laughs> that being said, don't really disagree. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's fair. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Oh, okay, what else we got? Yeah, that's rough. That's a game I'll I'll never play. Oh. YouTube forces the Vanced app to shut down oh. privateer community in shambles. I I wouldn't say shambles. There are alternatives to Vanced, but I want to get out ahead of this before anyone gets this in their mind cuz some people did. I had nothing to do with this. Guys, do you imagine based on the timeline it's your that fault. This actually aligns with us talking about Vanced in our return YouTube dislike button video? Yep. Come on. An organization the size of Google, a problem that's been around as long as Vanced, and you think that they suddenly said, giddy up, lawyers, here we go? Come on. I have it on good authority. This had nothing to do with me. Nope, nope. No, not a single person at Google nor YouTube had any idea what Vanced was or yeah. knew that it existed until they saw your video. That's right. I am the one authority yeah. that Google employees lean on to they learn they about don't technology. Actually, yeah, they don't actually like read or watch anything else. Just yeah. Linus Tech videos. It's actually a rule that they're not allowed. Yes. Yeah, it's illegal. So, the news broke early Sunday with a tweet from the developers. Vanced has been discontinued in the coming days. The download links on the website will be taken down. We know this is not something you wanted to hear, but it's something we need to do. Thank you all for supporting us over the years. The devs then added, currently installed versions will work just fine until they become outdated in two years or so. But that's a guess. If YouTube is Absolutely. really about making sure that Vanced They'll dies a quick death, there will be some kind of functionality breaking change to the API that will otherwise appear to be arbitrary that will cause Vanced to stop working. YouTube Vanced was a very popular app for Android, primarily due to its ability to block all video ads on YouTube without a subscription to YouTube Premium, as well as enable other functionality that was either Premium exclusive or Vanced exclusive. It enabled... Um, features like uh, background play and picture-in-picture -picture viewing and also enabled uh, the ability to play a video on repeat, uh, a non-idiotic way to change video quality, and swipe controls to change volume and brightness while viewing in full screen without having to pull the notification shade down. Another handy feature was the ability to override max resolution so you could watch 4K video on a 1080p device, allowing for higher bitrate video streams. It also had an all-black OLED theme and included the ability to share a video with a timestamp, a feature that is conspicuously missing from the official app in spite of the fact that I have complained about it to YouTube numerous times. It's actually shocking. Seems like a very easy thing to fix. It too. seems like they could probably fix it in an afternoon, yeah. and they just don't because 
Yep. Um, alternatives do exist. None have the same quality or rapid support that Vance has managed. So it is a sad day indeed for privateers. Yeah, I'm, I'm honestly stunned that Vance was able to exist as big as it was. For as long as for it was. For as long as it did. Because it's a modified version of the YouTube app, making it way more illegal than alternative, fully open source alternatives like New Pipe, hence... Um, like New Pipe, excuse me. And that's why Google was understandably so upset about it. Discussion question here is, what do you think happened to make them finally take legal action against Vanced? Um, I think it could be... prepping it for the, a bit. Uh, it could have been... Well, they probably have had it prepped for a long time. But if I had to guess, it could have been Vanced's recent attempt to monetize... Oh, I didn't know. Yeah, through they did some kind of uh, That's like, like an NFT sure. thing with the Vance logo or something like oh, that, great. which bore a lot of similarity to the YouTube logo. Um, there have been other community speculations about what exactly happened. Um, I don't see any any other good guesses in the in the chat so far. Yeah, that's about it. Uh, our other discussion question is, what changes do you think could make the YouTube app better? I mean, a lot of the stuff that Vance had is just obvious stuff that Google should have already done. I specifically asked a Google contact of mine, like, hey, d d did you guys like look at the Vance app for functionality? And the answer I got was very non-committal. So maybe they do, maybe they don't. I, but... the, the shared timestamp thing drives me nuts because it's actually not super common that I'll share videos without timestamps these days. Like yeah, it's, that's just how I share. It's just things. how you share videos. If it's a if it's a Twitch stream, if it's a Twitch video, if it's a if you, YouTube video, whatever. If you could link to a particular point in an article, you would. That's I'm great. going to. Yeah. Exactly. So if I see something on my phone and I'm like, oh, I want to share this with someone, then I'm just like, oh, okay, well now I need to go find a computer or like message yeah. this to myself and then I'll do it later because like I don't want to send them the raw link and then tell them to navigate. I do sometimes, but it's not ideal. It feels very ancient whenever you have to do that. Yeah, Why is this still a problem? Um, Star Wars Sky says, speaking of privateering, got my ad block shirt in today. Been nice. wearing it since. Feels amazing. Yeah, nice. the new shirts are super nice. Uh, and a question from Filet Ojava. Are merch messages working? Yeah, they're working. They've been coming up. They've been coming up the whole time. If you mean, are they working from a business perspective? The answer is absolutely. People love merch messages. It's so much better than like super chats or or whatever things there are on Twitch because you you get to pay money to have your message read or seen, and you also well, that like part's actually free. Get your order in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Oh, okay. This is a cool topic. I had an anonymous employee from an anonymous large NVIDIA competitor reach out and say, hey, Linus, I really feel like your take was not very good on the big NVIDIA leak. Because I think you and I were talking about saying, I'm sure NVIDIA's competitors will be taking a close look at this. And they basically gave me an um actually that... I wanted to share with you guys. So this is from an anonymous person who I have verified does in fact work for a large NVIDIA competitor, but I will be keeping everything completely anonymous because I agreed to do that in order to have the benefit of sharing their thoughts with you in a way that doesn't uh, endanger their employment. In the March 7th WAN show, we discussed the possibility that the DLSS source code leak could benefit competitors, but according to our insider, a leak like NVIDIA's is dangerous to the whole industry because anyone who looks at it is now effectively radioactive in terms of employment. From a United States legal perspective, corporate IP is protected several ways. Copyright, patent, trademark, trade secrets, the legal term for it, NDAs, the ITAR and EAR, so U.S. Export Controls on Weapons and Technology, licensing agreements and IP sharing agreements with third parties, and even between departments at the same company, and open source licensing. Effectively, there is no way for one company to utilize or even look at another company's leaked IP without facing unnatural amounts of criminal, commercial, and civil charges. Everyone is ready to sue each other at a moment's notice, so everyone generally plays it safe. And this was an anecdote. At one point, employees quit one company, uh, took a hard drive full of secrets, and tried to use it to get a job at another one. Company two said F off, 
and mailed the drives back to Company One. Interesting. None of this was surprising, and I did not expect or think at any level that a company approach would be this. But I was expecting individuals who were not going to disclose this to their boss. It sounds like we got a very scrupulous person yes. who reached out to us. Which is great. Um... Uh, okay, this is one more point that they made. The most legal way to steal ideas from ideas from another company is to poach the employees involved. And even then, they can't just re-implement IP yeah. from their former company. The only legal and sane, they say, option is to have them explain the theory behind the hardware slash algorithm and attempt to re-implement it in a way that doesn't violate protections. Which is, I believe, exactly what we were saying. Which is what we were saying could potentially happen whether the people who don't look at it realize or not. Yes. So we'll see. We shall see. But yeah, thank you very much for sharing your perspective. That was extremely helpful and absolutely something that I don't think we explained very well or yeah. really gave any air time to whatsoever. Yeah, there's How no dangerous way, it is to steal IP. Yeah, there's no way a, a company approach would be to do that because someone on the inside is going to whistleblow and yeah. you're just going to get nuked. Absolutely. Like it's it's And yeah. you got to understand how inbred the tech industry is. Like within the time that I've been doing this, I have seen individuals jump between competitors and go come full circle. Well, not even necessarily competitors. I've I've seen People relatively large, like one that I can think of right now, has gone from NVIDIA to Logitech. Yep. I don't believe they compete in anything. Nope. But, yeah. I mean, um, just trying to remember, I'm just trying to remember all the, all the paths. Dang it. Okay, so Jim Keller went from, what was it? AMD to Tesla to Apple, back to AMD to Intel? And I actually don't remember the pre-AMD, but I believe, I don't, I'm not sure if he started at AMD. Like, that gives you some idea. So if you think that there aren't, amongst a team, or an entire company, right, that there aren't still lingering connections, you are, you are sorely mistaken. Yeah. Sorely mistaken. And we're not recommending anything, to be super clear as well. Um, yeah. All right. Is that it? For the show? I mean, we could talk about Microsoft experimenting with Windows 11 ads again, this time in File Explorer. Oh, this, was, uh, this was drafted by the new writer as well. Windows um, 11 just sounds horrible. So spicy. Yeah. yeah, pretty annoying. That that sucks. Um, they said, this is the statement, this was an experimental banner that was not intended to be published externally and was turned off. Yeah, thank you for working on that, <laughs> Mr. LeBland, uh, instead of something better that people actually want. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Why don't we do some merch messages? These have actually spurred such interesting conversations lately. I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. Taylor says, how many LTT gift cards can be applied at checkout? Um, I don't know. I have no idea. It's either one or probably an extreme amount. Michael L. asks, don't know. I need some advice. I'm still using a 6700K with a 3080. I'm overdue for still a, using a, a CPU upgrade. However, no, no, with the 3080. I got it. Yeah, yeah. okay. I'm not big on adopting a latest gen that has firsts like DDR5, PCIe Gen 5. In your opinion, is Alder Lake stable enough or would you wait for Raptor Lake? Ooh. For me, I would go for it. I love the bleeding edge. I'm all about it. But if you don't like the bleeding edge, based on... Man, because it, it's the first for Big Little, too. Like, it's not just first, like, DDR5 and PCIe Gen 5. It's, like, first for Big Little stuff. architecture yeah. in, uh, on x86 that I'm aware of. Wow. Huh. I mean... I mean, yeah, I would go for it. Yeah, I'd, I'd go for it. What would you, what would you guys, uh, what would you guys do? Chat? I would just base it on, on how 
hungry he is for an upgrade like how much do you actually need it um like what what are you doing with your system and yeah. what do you need out of your system if you don't need an upgrade right now just wait there's no way your 6700k is a problem for 60 hertz that's but if yeah. you're a high refresh rate gamer then yeah 12900k would be a big upgrade 12700k too actually it's a really good game yeah, like 6700k's they're not garbage they're still pretty yeah. solid it just chat, depends on what you're doing chat we want to hear about it A lot of people saying go Zen 3. Yep, Zen 3 is valid. And is pretty mature at this point. Total Wire says go 10th gen. Oh, interesting. Okay, go 10th gen. Stay away from Windows 11. Yeah, okay, well, you're going to get a lot of different advice down there. Man, I would just go 12th gen personally, but hard to say. Philip says, what's the possibility of seeing a video focused on float planes operations at some point? I need more Luke videos, and it doesn't seem like Scrapyard Wars will make a return anytime soon. The problem with talking about your, like, architecture is that a lot of it is, like, security and IP and... We don't, yeah, we don't intend on doing anything, like, obscurity through... Bleh, security through obscurity, because that, that's garbage anyways. But, like, I also don't think it would do very well on the channel. Yeah, it's tough. Like, I've kind of wondered before about, like, reaching out to Wendell and, like, collabing on his channel to talk about some of the stuff that we do. Because, like, he has videos on, like, Docker and whatever else and his yeah. community's into it. But, like... You got to understand it's all very software-y. Yeah. There's no hardware to show you. It's it's all running in just... Data centers. Rented, yeah, rented space and data centers. They literally centers. Can't, can't show can't. you physical things at all. Yeah, the security of those places is crazy. And we're not getting in there. We're not getting inside, so that's uh, tough. So yeah, I, I just don't, yeah. And it would like actually be a non-trivial amount of work uh, when we have many things to work on. Um, that being said, I think I'm overdue to do a tech wiki or something, so. Yeah. And I'm here, I'm here every week. Curtis, I know Scrapyard Wars isn't coming back, but what about build challenges between staff? Most FPS per a watt consumed. Oh, that's kind of a fun one. Cardboard case again, but with time and a budget. Best looking wall mount system. Yeah, those are not bad ideas. Uh, I know that we're planning to do some kind of like amazing PC building race. And it's a play on okay, amazing, yeah, the amazing race, race and like PC race, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, where we'll have to complete some kind of challenges to get our parts to ultimately build a computer. Okay. I think Intel sponsoring it, it should be fun. I don't know if we have any kind of Scrapyard Warsy things planned for the time being. We do want to revisit cardboard cases, though. That was actually really fun. Draven says, love the show, love your server rack home PC setup. Curious, what a good solution for routing multiple home server racked gaming PCs to multiple access points would be. Okay, so a number of ways you could do it. You could use Steam and home streaming, and you could do it over IP, like an internet protocol. Sorry, we use I, I just used IP to mean intellectual property like very recently, so I should be careful with that. You're not going to get the greatest quality, and there will be a latency delay. So depending on what you're trying to do, it may or may not be the best approach. The way that I am planning to do it, because I haven't actually revealed this yet, but I am planning to make my personal rig accessible from two different locations. Ooh. The way that I'm planning to do it is just with optical display port and optical USB running through the wall, both connected to the computer, and the two displays running at the same resolution and cloned. Makes sense. Very rudimentary. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense, though. Like, you don't need more than that. Two sets of peripherals, yeah. identical, running at the same DPI settings and everything. Sweet. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Yeah, that sounds great. I, it doesn't need to be more complicated than that. Yeah, my other display will probably wake when I'm doing stuff, which isn't great for security, but I'm at home, so I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He also said, Luke, hope you get your Steam Deck soon. Uh, yeah, still no email, so... Yeah, good luck with that. I'm not holding out hope. Uh, Emmanuel asks, what's your favorite part of your job and what's the most frustrating part of your job? Wow. Uh, favorite part... My favorite part is you guys. Aww. Aww, cop out Aww. answer. <laughs> My favorite part is facilitating and witnessing creation of things that like often don't feel possible. Yeah, that's been really cool on the full plane side of things. Uh, most frustrating part of my job is mostly talking to vendors. Mm. Well, you had a pretty good call with one this week. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. Yep. That was pretty cool. The most yep. frustrating part of my job is definitely you guys. 
you send me all kinds of conflicting messages. This was good. We hated this thing. We love you, Linus. We think you can't keep doing this if you want your community to stay behind you. If you don't keep doing this, yeah. your community's not going to stay behind yeah, you. Yeah, I know. On it's, the same video. It's it's hard. It's very hard. Yeah. I have, it's like, I'm always reminded of that scene from Office Space where the guy's explaining like how many different bosses he has and how he spends all his time reporting into people. I feel like I have 14 million bosses. <laughs> yeah. All with different deliverables <laughs> and different temperaments. Yep. Yep. Pretty rough. Jack Stalgia says, Hey, Linus and Luke, I remember a while ago you made a video discussing your issues with random battery drain on Samsung phones. Is this an issue you're still experiencing? Currently dealing with this on an S22. I haven't seen it in a couple... I didn't see it um, for a long time on my Note 9, and I haven't seen it at all on my Fold 3. I have to imagine it's some app that manages to vampire the crap out of the battery while battery monitoring apps do not detect it because I couldn't find anything that would pick up what was draining my flipping battery. I don't know. I only ever experienced it on Samsung phones, but I haven't been able to, and I couldn't reliably replicate it. I don't know. By the way, I think I struck a chord. Um, Flipline chat sort of exploded after I mentioned the talking with vendors thing. I guess this is a common thing that people don't like. <laughs> it's the worst. It's, it's rough. Yeah. Birdie TX, uh, I'm in the market for a new swap smartwatch. I've been using the Pebble Steel for nine years. And it finally died. I'm sorry to hear that, man. Pebble, pff, so good, so good. Any recommendations? I've been looking at Garmin watches, but LT hasn't LCT hasn't reviewed any yet. Any chance for that in the future? Smartwatch reviews don't perform well for us. I think that's the kind of thing we'd need to create a specific channel, like smart devices and wearables or something like that, because they just there's a lot of people that really care. Uh, but there's not a really lot of people that care kind of a bit, which is what we actually need. Um, I've been using the Galaxy Watch 4. It's fine, I guess. I don't know, man. I, I'm honestly considering just switching to an analog watch. Maybe I'll just get like a Casio calculator watch or something like that. Yeah. Just go retro. I just I find it's just not that useful anymore. I really liked... I, I loved my Pebble. It did everything I needed it to do. Long battery life. The screen was readable under any conditions. I just, I don't know, man. I'm just so utterly unimpressed. I feel like I want something more basic. Yeah. Just notifications and time. Nothing else. I don't want it to do calls. I don't want yeah. notifications and time. Like there are times it comes in handy. I, I did take a call on it when I was like on a badminton court and my phone was on the side and like, it was in the middle of, uh, there was a gap. I was like, actually, this is from my pharmacy. I really need to take this. Hi, yep, yep, sure. I'll be there to pick it up tomorrow. You know, like, it, it's, it's useful, but I don't know. <laughs> like, it runs out of battery in one day sometimes, just that's, inexplicably. That's, yeah, that's right. I have no, I have, I've done no additional setup on it. I've installed no additional apps or anything like that. I use it for nothing other than telling the time and occasionally looking at a notification when it happens to work. And it'll just die in the middle of the day sometimes. I just don't get it. That's rough. Anonymous spent $69.98 and asked, nice. you talk about LTT Labs and what it will do, but could you talk more about Creator Warehouse? IRC, you said that you would do other stuff for other creators. Do you plan to try to make it a one-stop shop for high-quality merch and making products? Um, we don't know exactly. Yeah, we'd love to, we'd love to service other creators. Right now, we don't have a solid structure for that because we're based in Canada. We ship worldwide. A lot of creators are in the US. How do we handle the taxation around that? It's really complicated. It's tough. So wait, you're saying you bought this, uh, garment in the Philippines and then you printed it in Canada. But the person who actually owns it is in America, but then the money comes from Europe and it goes first to them and then to you. No, no, it goes to you and then to them. But then the invoice was paid by them and then... Ugh. Spooky. Ugh. Taxes are spooky. Yeah, it's really complicated. Because they're really difficult to do. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. I mean, we'd love to just pay our taxes. Yep. You know? No problem. No problem. We pay our taxes 
and we're, we're glad that we have schools and hospitals and roads and libraries and all that stuff yeah. that matters a lot. It's that it's so hard. It's just really complicated. Thanks, and lobbying. As for, as for making products, I mean, we want it to just be a place where we like make cool stuff that we think is really cool. We had a really cool idea that we found out is patented and we have a call with a lawyer to find out if we can get around the patent with a solution that I think is hilarious because it's how we wanted to do the product anyway that might make it not in violation of the patent. I'll explain it to you off camera. Okay, sweet. But that one's probably, that one's probably a year out anyway. Unlike the screwdriver and backpack, if you're tuning in a little bit late today, on LTTstore.com, you can now sign up for an email list that will notify you once the... Oh, whoops. Sorry, sorry. That's not what I meant to do. Uh, uh, this one. You can sign up for a notification that will tell you when the backpack and the screwdriver are in stock. There we go. Sorry about that. And... What was I talking about? I don't even remember. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we just want to make cool stuff that we think is cool. There you go. Yeah. Last one. Gregory, been watching the channel for about a year and become a big fan. I'm wondering how you decide how many videos each week to star in. Uh, do you try to hit a certain quota or is it dependent on how interested you are in your availability? Mostly availability. I try and I try and host and review scripts for as much of it as I can. It's just not always possible and I trust my team to anything I can't do, they're going to do, they're going to kill it. So it's great. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the great thing about having a team is uh, you know when I have time I do it and when I'm on vacation or whatever videos still get made. Amazing, right? How many YouTubers can say that? I'm so proud of the team that we have here. There, that that's my favorite thing about working here is absolutely the team. You guys rock. All right. Cool. Bye. <laughs> that was abrupt. <laughs> Scoba Do in the float plane chat asks, wonder if LTT will ever have a US based operation to make tax stuff easier? Uh, the answer is no, because that would be way harder. I am a Canadian citizen. Ah, uh, owning a US based business as a Canadian citizen? Not, compli uh, not complicated at all. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that'd be bad. It would be very, 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 very bad. <laughs> I am pausing the selected, ending the stream, and...